Funding for the Hinckley Report is made possible in part by the George S. and Dolores Dore Eccles Foundation and the Cleone Peterson Eccles Endowment Fund. Good evening, and welcome to The Hinckley Report. I'm Jason Perry, director of the Hinckley Institute of Politics. Covering the week, we have Michelle Quist, columnist with the Salt Lake Tribune, Michael Maurer, deputy chief of staff to Governor Gary Herbert, and Benjamin Wood, political reporter with the Salt Lake Tribune. So glad to have you all with us today. Let's jump right in. Michelle, we're gonna start with you, okay? okay. Uh, Mitt Romney, two days before he's officially sworn in, did something sort of unusual. He wrote an, an op-ed to the Washington Post going straight after President Trump on policy and on character. Talk for a second about what he said in this, in this op-ed piece. Well, you know, it was actually exactly what I think Utahns wanted to here. He talked about the fact that Trump, um, his moral code is kind of off and that he doesn't necessarily represent Utahns and, and he doesn't necessarily represent, um, you know, the average general citizen. Uh, it was it was bold. <laughs> it was unique or surprising because it, you know, came out two days before he was going to be sworn in and in and, and a national uh, media piece, but um, I think Utahns were thrilled to see it. Mm -hmm. Mike, you've been a strategist for so yeah. many candidates. Ex explain your thoughts on the timing of this. You know, I, I'll i have to leave that to Mitt. I'll, I'll say I'm a big Mitt fan. Uh, I Was I surprised when it came out? Yes. But, you know, as, as a strategist, I'm going to have to say he has a good team around him. I really like the team he's put together. Uh, one of the things I'm most excited about, they're Utahns. Uh, from top to bottom, uh, Adam Gardner, for example, mm -hmm. is his new state director, and Kelsey Berg's back in D.C. He's got a good Utah team. You know, Mitt, Mitt was elected in a landslide. He can kind of make his own decisions on these things. Okay. So, so Ben, I want to pull these two things together because what Michelle said is interesting. Are Utahns wanting this from him? I mean, this is pretty sharp, right? It went after the president. Is this where Utahns are primarily? Did they feel good about it based on all your conversations? Yeah, we saw reactions from outside Utah were more mixed than they were in Utah. I mean, like Mike said, he won with a landslide vote with more share of the vote than Donald Trump did in Utah in 2016. Uh, Mitt Romney's a very popular guy. He tends to do things that Utah's like to see him do. I, I didn't see a lot of pushback locally from uh -huh. this. But as a, as a reporter, I, I, I'm not seeing you covering Mitt Romney also. This is a question I've noticed everyone gets. It's a question I get when people are interviewing me about Mitt Romney is, is he going to be the one that goes after Trump? I mean, it, it, it is, do you feel like that's what he just set the stage for? Uh, to a certain degree. I mean, I th he said he wanted to clarify his position before he takes on this new job. I and mean, there's always been this looming question of how much and to what degree will he push back on the president. He reminded the nation that he is willing to do this when he feels the need. And right before he got sworn in, uh -huh. he made sure he put that shot across the bow. Uh -huh. uh, to the nation is interesting. Michelle, can we, can we talk about that? Because this was... You know, a national publication he sent yeah, this to. What do you right. make of that? You know, uh, the the national, um, you know, a response to it was curious. Um, they weren't like like Ben said. They weren't as positive as you know. They were more questionable. They were like, why is this coming out? And um, you know, you kind of are going back and forth again. Mitt, is this you know, is this what you're doing? Uh -huh. But even our own uh, Congressman Chaffetz, <laughs> yeah. former Congressman Chaffetz, went after Mitt on this one. Well, yes, Chaffetz is very conservative, and you know, this this didn't go along with the conservative script, at least not the far right. Uh huh. So, uh, so, so Ben, because uh, I want to get to Mike on on some other things on on the Mitt Romney commentary about what he thinks the country should be doing. But but when when Mitt Romney is setting the stage, is this him helping? Helping to position the Republican Party? Is he reclaiming that, that post, you think? Because uh, we had some high profile people leave uh, as of late. Is this him helping the party? Uh, I, I would imagine he thinks he's helping the party. I, I, wouldn't, I don't think he would have done this if he thinks it hurts the party. And there's been a lot of speculation about what this means for his future. You know, he's been adamant that he does not want to run for president again. But there's also this idea of what if someone else runs against Donald Trump? Will Mitt Romney back a primary challenge? He isn't saying on that point, but it's hard to not read into this op-ed the potential for him to be offering support for a hypothetical challenge. You know, I thought it was interesting that just a week before, Senator Lee had come out mm -hmm. saying, I support President Trump. And so to me, part of, uh, you know, Senator Romney's response here maybe was differentiating himself, you know, be between mm -hmm. the two senators. I I'm sure it's very uncomfortable for him 
to be the junior senator, you know, you know, under Mike, um, but he is, and, and I think maybe he wanted to, to put himself out there and say, I'm not really that junior. I'll tell you, our, our focus and concern uh, coming from the governor's office is getting beyond personalities, getting beyond kind of the, the 2020 concerns on, on both the Democratic and Republican side and solving the problems that the Congress was uh, created to solve. We, we don't have a budget. We have a government shutdown taking place. That's that's where our focus is on. What are we doing to make sure that that people are getting federal workers are getting paid, that we're getting the parks reopened? I mean, so so it's you know it's certainly been something that's been discussed. But our concern as a state is all right. Let's get past the infighting in Washington. Let's do things in the Utah mm -hmm. way. Bring people together, solve issues, and move forward for the good of the nation. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to get to the government shutdown in just a moment, but a couple of pieces I feel like we should address. In, in this op-ed. One, I want to show you a graphic, and Mike, maybe you talk about this for just a second. Let me read it. Uh, this is part of the, the speech in the op-ed from uh, Senator Romney. He says, to a great degree, a presidency shapes the public character of the nation. A president should unite us and inspire us to follow our better angels. And it is in this province where the incumbent's shortfall has been most glaring. Uh, interesting part going to the character. What is the role of the president in your mind based on this to shape the character of the nation? Well, let, let, let me bring it down to the state level where I'm most familiar. And that is by saying, you know, Mitt, Mitt's statement can speak to itself and he can tell us all what it means. But at the Utah level, I've been fortunate to work for two governors, Governor John Huntsman and now Governor Gary Herbert, both of whom took the mantle of, of leadership very seriously in the mantle of inclusiveness and in the mantle of setting the tone for the state. Again, I'm not pointing fingers in any direction outside of our state, but within our state, we've been very fortunate to have leaders who try to bring people together, who try to unite people. I think Governor Huntsman and Governor Herbert have both worked very hard that way. It's difficult to do, but at the Utah level, it's working. And again, we like to think of Utah as kind of an example to the nation. We balance our budget every year. We're collegial to one another. We we try to be friends and, and try not to demonize each other in politics. I think that's an example that Washington uh, can take from Utah, uh, kind of the example that, that, that our leaders here in the state have uh, have set for several years. Mm -hmm. Well, and the, the presidency is one person. You know, it's a co-equal branch of government, but the other two branches are made up of, of you know, mm -hmm. made up of a group of people. Presidency is our focus point. You know, we've got Washington and Lincoln and Kennedy and Reagan. You know, these are people that men men. I, I hope there's a woman soon, but, um, you know, th these are men that have, have led with honor and respect and, you know, something that we can, can point to and look up to, and this is what America is, and Trump has not been that man. Uh-huh. Uh, one of the other points, uh, Ben, in this uh, op-ed was about American leadership. Uh, he, he spent a lot of time on this, where uh, the administration needs to needs to provide the leadership in the world, and the world is looking for that kind of leadership, and which he thinks maybe we've lost some of that. Tell us where Utahns are that you're interviewing them on that key principle. I think there's certainly some uh, concern. I mean, you, you see Mitt Romney's op-ed, he cited uh, the resignation of top administration officials, the abrupt decision to withdraw from Syria. You know, I, I think locally there are people who, even despite supporting the president, supporting the Republican Party, are concerned about perhaps the speed these decisions are made, the, the amount of input going into these decisions. So I definitely don't think Mitt Romney is alone in wondering how steady the hands are at the wheel. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, why don't we keep with you, Ben, for a second on this. So the Trump from, the response from Trump was pretty quick. All right, what was it? Uh, I mean, from my memory, he questioned whether Trump, uh, Romney would be a new flake and wishes he would be more of a team player. And then in, in private comments, you know, he talked about how he had endorsed Romney and Romney had accepted his endorsement. And, and what a shame he's not playing for the team. Yeah, Michelle, what do you make of that flake comment? Because that was the question, right? Is he another flake? I hope not. That's what he said, right? Right, right. You know, he, he doesn't like people who speak out against him or that are a able to stand up against him. And, you know, I, I think he needed to put it out there as kind of a warning, you know, is, is this going to happen again? Because because if you're not going to play my game, we're going to have some problems. I think that's what his message is. Uh -huh. So the the last part of his tweet called on Mitt Romney to be a team player. Is that what, what, what does that mean, you think? Well, I, I think to Romney, it, it doesn't mean much. You know, Romney does what he thinks is right. He has the um, character and the experience to do what's right, whether mm -hmm. it's, you know, whether... Um, it's popular or not, mm -hmm. and I, I think that scares Trump. Okay, so let's get back to the point that you brought up first, Mike, because this is all happening in the middle of a government right. shutdown. <clears throat> 14 days as uh, the time of filming, which is you know yeah. getting up there in terms of the, the longest government shutdown we've had. 
Well, I think it's really disappointing how that, you know, we, we seem, it, it's kind of the politics of brinkmanship that, that time and again, we're having another government shutdown. It's interesting, the state got very prepared this year, Chris Cox and her team, legislative leadership who oversees the finances and said, all right, if we have another shutdown, what steps do we need to be taking to prepare for it? And they took those steps. And for example, this time we kept the parks open, but it's, it's become kind of an embarrassment. And we're a state looking at, look, when our legislature convenes, one of the first things they do is adopt a base budget so that if everything else falls apart at the end of the year, we have a budget that we're operating on. <clears throat> and then throughout the session, they add to that budget and then finally do a final budget. Why can't Congress do some of these things? You know, why is everything so uh, poisoned politically back there that it's, you know, the, the entire operating funds of the, the nation are coming down, um, mm -hmm. you know, to one key point. So it's, it's disappointing for us as a state because we're the ones that often have to live with the consequences. We're okay for the next few weeks here in Utah, but come the end of the month, we're worried about uh, women, infant, and children who rely on some federal assistance. <clears throat> we're worried about, you know, the national parks that we've kept them going for a couple of weeks, but that, that probably can't last indefinitely. So we have some concerns. We prepared for it. We just plead with the folks in Washington, get together and make it work. Mm -hmm. uh, ben, <coughs> how impacted are Utahns feeling with this closure? I mean, are, are, do Utahns seem to care very much that this has happened? Well, government shutdown's interesting in that they start small and then they get bigger as they mm -hmm. go. So in the early stages, yeah, you have maybe some decreased services at the parks, maybe the post office. As time goes on, you get the school lunch program. Right. You get other, you know, medical services. Mm -hmm. So the longer this goes, Utahns will start to notice the government shutdown and they'll start to feel it. Uh -huh. uh, Mike, let's come back to you for a second. What did the state do uh, to mitigate some of the, the impacts of the, well, the parks? One of the big ones we had with parks was just coming up with money to help keep the doors open. Uh, and, and to help keep the gates. We had a problem several years ago where we realized we've, we've run a big ad campaign worldwide to bring people to our parks and it's worked extremely well. Well, there's nothing more disappointing if you're a <clears throat> couple from China or a family from Belgium that have saved up your money to visit rural Utah and uh, the national parks and you get there and the gates are shut. And we saw that last time. And so Governor and Sec Governor Herbert and Secretary Jewell uh, came up with a compromise. We're still waiting to get paid back by the feds for that money. But most importantly, we kept the local industries going. We kept the tourism industry going. And we let a lot of people into our parks who otherwise would have been locked out of our parks. And so this year, realizing this might happen again, we came up with the initial funding not, you know, hoping that it would have been resolved by now. Um, and, but it's kind of a, you know, take it day by day, park by park on mm -hmm. what we'll be able to do to mitigate the effects. But Ben highlights it really well. The, the bigger effects long term will be the school lunch program and other federal programs that Utahns rely on that often they don't uh, understand are being paid for by the feds. Another thing is we're really concerned about federal workers who aren't getting a paycheck. Mm -hmm. There aren't a lot of Americans, mm -hmm. there aren't a lot of us who could, who could have a paycheck delayed for two weeks or a month or a month and a half and not have it impact you in, in a meaningful uh, and negative way. Yeah. You know, a lot of Utahns uh, think the federal government is too big anyway. So a shutdown starts and, and they don't feel as nervous about it. They're like, oh, good. You know, we're, mm -hmm. our government is, you know, too big. And if it, if it needs to, if it's shut down now and we're not noticing, then maybe we don't need it at all. You know, it's kind of the initial. Um, and honestly, this is this is shock and awe for Trump. He loves this stuff. I mean, this is his bread and butter. He'll he'll put his foot down and stay there for you know for months and months, which is which is nervous. Mm -hmm. um, this isn't this is a, a Republican failure, uh, you know. And the people who, like Mike said, depend on mm -hmm. uh, federal monies for paychecks, they budgeted for this mm -hmm. and and they relied on it. And it's not fair just because you think government is too big to be okay with the fact that they're not mm -hmm. now getting paid. Mm -hmm. How effective is it to use sort of the government shutdown as the bargaining chip? I, it's not effective at all, I don't think, because uh, people, you know, again, once two or three weeks starts to pass, they, they yeah. get uncomfortable with it because it's uh -huh. affecting them personally. And yes, they, they want the wall, and this, is, this was great for Trump at the beginning, but wait. Now, I, I'm not getting paid and I have to go to the doctor and you know, exactly. what am I gonna do? Mm -hmm. Ben, let's talk about this wall, right? So this is where he put his foot down, right? So, so the president is saying he wants the wall. Um, and the, the House seems to be coming along with the, with the bill, but the Senate certainly is not at all, right? Nancy Pelosi uh, is talking about this this whole week. I'm not gonna give the wall, right? So, so where, where do you see this, this going uh, based on all, the, all your sources and interviews you're doing? 
<sighs> That's a hard question. I mean, the, compounding this is that we just had a change of power in the house. So what was true a week ago is no longer true. I mean, it, it doesn't look like the Democrats in the House or the Senate, for that matter, are looking to budge on the wall anytime soon. You know, they now control a chamber of Congress. They can filibuster a vote in the other chamber. Their ability to press the president on this issue has increased dramatically since yesterday. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's why it was a Republican failure, because when we can, when Republicans controlled government, they couldn't get it done. And now a week later, now Democrats control, you know, one of the houses and, oh, they've already passed a bill that fixes, you know, that, that passes a budget or, 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 you know, passes some of the spending bills. You have two senators, at least, that are going to side with, you know, getting um, over this this shutdown because they're they're in election years, you know, mm -hmm. two years, they're close enough. And um, it, 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 if it, if they fix it now, which obviously we're going to, the storyline will be because Democrats came in and, and, and saved it in a bipartisan way, mm -hmm. and we Republicans couldn't do that. Interesting. And I, but I think that's part of the challenge is it becomes winners and losers. I mean, the Republicans have a legitimate issue with border security. It isn't just a wall. It's too many people who fly in here and overstay their visas. Mm -hmm. So there's a very legitimate concern on border security. That needs to be addressed. But unfortunately, it becomes so toxic, it's, you know, did... Did this, you know, did Senator Romney win or did President Trump win in this exchange? Did the Democrats win? Did the Republicans win? It becomes, it, again, it becomes about the horse race uh, rather than the results for the country. Uh -huh. Which Trump loves. <clears throat> and to Mike's point, I mean, border security is not going to be solved in a short term spending plan. Because mm -hmm. when they do reopen the government, it won't be with a full budget. We'd love to see that, but it's not going to happen. It'll be another month, maybe two months, et cetera, and then we'll just be right back here. And so these issues that need to be solved, if you're using the shutdown as a bargaining chip, you're not actually getting to the meat of the problem. Uh -huh. Let's talk about these winners and losers for a second, because I have this very interesting graphic from Senator Mike Lee uh, when he was on, on national publications this week. This is what he said about the Democrats and what they're, what they're causing to happen here. He says, Democrats are being categorically unreasonable. We already have 650 miles of border fence. <coughs> are they saying there is something inherently evil about what would be the 651st mile? I mean, when you, start, when you start seeing that, Ben, all right, so I mean, is, is this a position for winners or losers, or is this just sort of the Republican failure that Michelle is kind of talking about? This is politics. I mean, this, this is the, the purest encapsulation of politics we've seen in a long time. I mean, the Senate passed a bill before the Christmas break that would have reopened the government, and they thought they had an arrangement, and the president tore that arrangement to pieces, and here we are. So it's all politics. I, I don't think you can pick any one is the righteous party in this case. I mean, if you, if you Google Mike Lee and shut down, you're going to get articles mm -hmm. from, from January 2018. Yeah. And then it's going to be, oh, wait, no, I, are, did they get the year wrong? No, they didn't. This was happening mm -hmm. last January 2018. It's, you know, it, it's a, uh, it, I don't, it's not a publicity stunt because it's way more serious than that. But um, people end, end up using it mm -hmm. as a uh, place to step up and it's mm -hmm. not. Okay, so let, let's take one of the threads that, that you mentioned a moment ago. We do have a brand new Congress. We have lots of new members, over 100, right? One-fifth, I think, are all brand new people. Right. And it's a new makeup. You, wrote, you did some, a great column on this. Thanks. Talk to us about uh, the new makeup of yes. our Congress, and we'll talk about what's happened locally, too. Yes, there are more women ever. It's a record-breaking. <clears throat> and there are, there's more diversity ever. It's you know, record-breaking in, in, in both areas. And uh, th they're all on the Democrat side. I mean, the re Republicans did didn't, you know, um, improve much in, in those areas. But as a whole, Congress now is is more diverse and, and it's more female. And I think um, the excitement across the nation is, you know, what's going to happen? How is it going to result in what kind of policy changes? I think I think it'll be interesting. Mm -hmm. I'm excited to see it. Mm -hmm. Michael, when you think about the more this more diverse Congress. You know, I think it's, it'll be very interesting to see it play out on the national level. It's received a lot of attention. Um, what's interesting, though, is here in Utah, we've had a 24% turnover in our legislature. And uh, we talk about it, one of the, I, you know, I'm doing a lot of cheerleading for Utah here, and it's, it, we're Team Utah, and it's wonderful to, to tout our successes. We really do have a citizen legislature. We have a natural turnover. We don't have term limits, which I think is a good thing because you need some institutional knowledge. But we have 24% of our legislature turning over. We're adding more women. And it's, it's a good thing in Utah. It's healthy. Uh, anytime you have a, a democratically elected body, you like to have it represent the demographic that it's uh, mm -hmm. leading. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. That's for sure. Ben, ben uh, 25 women now in our state legislature, 19 in the House, six in the Senate. As, as you're looking at legislation coming forward in this next legislative session, are we seeing uh, more participation at all, all parts of the state because we're having more broader representation? It certainly seems to be kind of a chicken and egg scenario. We had record voter turnout, and that produced a more diverse legislature. You know, and it's interesting, though, in both the Utah legislature and the national legislature, a lot of these gains in representation, uh, more women, more people of color, are largely on the Democratic side. I mean, the, here in Utah and nationally, the Republican Party is still largely white men. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's just spend one more moment on some of our new members. Uh, Mitt, Mitt Romney sworn in as Senator, Ben McAdams now sworn in as the newest member of, of Congress in, in the House. Um, he, Michelle, he, one of his first votes yeah. this week was against the Speaker. Right, right. Okay. He voted against Nancy Pelosi as a, a Speaker. I think he kind of had to. You know, his whole uh, uh, campaign, the, the campaign against him was, you know, Ben mm -hmm. equals Pelosi. And, and so he kind of had to come out of the the box and say, nope, I'm not, you know, and I, I don't know how long it'll last, but, um, you know, and, and he knew it was a symbolic vote, and uh, it was interesting to see. Uh -huh. You think there are any ramifications for him no. going forward? No. It was just one of those campaign <clears throat> things, and Nancy Pelosi will see it as that. Yeah, I mean, there was some, you know, uh, upset among the uh, Utah Democrats, mm -hmm. but um, memories are short. Okay, that's good. Uh, Mike, uh, let's talk about a law that just went into effect okay. in the state of Utah. We now have the strictest uh, DUI law in the country. We do. We're, <clears throat> we're now 0.05. Uh, there were several states last year that were considering it. Representative Norm Thurston from Provo kind of led the charge on it, and it came down to a matter of do we want to be the safest state in the country when it comes to uh, DUIs? Uh, Hawaii's looking at it. Uh, Washington's looking at it. The interesting thing is this is what's already done in Australia and Europe. And so what we're telling people is don't drink and drive. It's interesting when the debate was heating up, uh, the pro .05 folks released a, a TV commercial that had been produced by Anheuser-Busch. What was Anheuser-Busch's message? Don't drink and drive. And so that's kind of the message we're getting out. We have seen in the state already a drop in the number of DUI arrests, and a lot of it came about because this law was adopted a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. People assumed it was kind of already there. And so what we found is a lot more people taking Uber, a lot more people being responsible. Uh, we, we have very few arrests at the 0.05 to 0.08 level, uh, but if anything, we're trying to show we want to be safe and we want people who, tourists here to be safe, our families here to be safe. If you drink, uh, drink responsibly, and uh, better yet, if you d drink too much, heaven forbid, don't drive. Mm -hmm. M Michelle, people, people in the states, particularly those impacted by tourism, are worried right. that this is going to have a negative impact on our economy in some right. way. And, and there have been a few, you know, advertisements um, by national associations, you know, saying uh, Utah is, is an unfriendly place now, and there was an article about the ski, you know, people coming here to ski, and oh, well, I'm not going to come back. Um, I, I don't think that will pan out. I think, you know, our, our snow is, is better than the 0.05 <laughs> and worth it. And I think they'll just come and they'll stay closer to where they, you know, yeah. where they intend to drink. And I think they'll take ride sharing. Mm. And um, I, yeah. Okay. Ben, what about the, the image issue? Does, does this further, you know, make people concerned about drinking laws in the state or in the end? Is this kind of what Michelle is talking about? This is uh, it's overridden by other, other aspects. Short term, I think it does probably play into this image of Utah as you know, prudish on alcohol laws. Long term, we have no idea exactly what will come of this. But yeah, I mean, we have a history in this state of making it difficult for people to have a drink with their meal, and this probably does play into that image. Okay, very good. Uh, b before we go, let's talk about the speech that Ben McAdams gave before he left, touting a few of his successes, because I want to get into what's going to happen in Salt, Le in, in Salt Lake County. He talked in his, his resignation letter about the, the bond rating, about his work on homelessness, criminal justice, uh, more uh, greater local control for counties. Ben, uh, t t tell us what these candidates who are, who are vying for this particular position are, are saying right now. How are these co campaigns going? campaigns as such. It, these campaigns are interesting because it's not an open vote. I mean, it'll be the, the party will choose the replacement for Mayor ben, ben McAdams. So they're angling to a particular base of voters. They're angling to party people. Uh, so they're, you know, they're touting their record in some cases. They're touting their fresh approach in other cases. Uh, but this is really kind of a, a, a contained 
election mm -hmm. to a very particular group of people. Yeah. I mean, if, if it were bigger, if it were to the to the regular electorate, I mean, Jenny Wilson would be an obvious, you know, the moderate uh, Democrat who can, mm -hmm. you know, who has experience doing it. But because it is to, you know, party insiders, um, I, th I think Arlen Bradshaw has, you know, gotten a little um, uh, momentum because, you know, he's he's more liberal. Uh huh. Well, well, Mike. Uh, so so Jenny Wilson is coming off a campaign. Uh, right. So so t tell us about her machine, how she's going forward on this. And true, when she starts seeing people like Arlen Bradshaw start to. Yeah, I, I really thought, again, this is speculation because we our office doesn't get too involved in it. But part of it is I thought Jenny would build up a lot of goodwill for taking on Mitt. That was that was a tough mm -hmm. task. And we'll just have to see with with the Democratic delegates. Again, central committees are hugely important parts of the party. The Democrats have theirs that skews left. Ours tends to kind of skew a little right. You're playing to a different audience. You're mm -hmm. playing to the party activists, people who are Democrats for a reason, mm -hmm. or in our case, Republicans for a reason. And so I think it does change the dynamic, as Ben talked about. And I, you know, I don't know of any polling that's going on right now. So it'll be it'll be a really interesting race to watch to kind of see how do Democrats want to position themselves with their candidates moving forward in Utah. M Michelle, why has Shireen done so well? Um, she did she did a great campaign against Chris Stewart. I mean, she was out there knocking doors every single day. Her, I mean, she got over. I don't know if it was in the high 70s, you know, in, in Salt Lake County. Um, she's shown that that she's the real deal. OK, can't wait to watch this particular race. Sorry, that's where we're going to have to end it today. Thank you for your comments You're and welcome. your insights. Well, that's it for the Hinkley Report. For more on the issues of the week, please visit us online at KUED.org slash Hinkley Report. Thank you and good night.